Welcome to Chapter 11 on Agreement. A valid offer creates a power in the offeree to create a contract by agreeing to its terms. The law determines whether a person intended to make an offer by looking objectively at all the facts and circumstances in which it is made. The law of offer and acceptance is premised on the common law concept of meeting of the minds, in which an offeree understands and accepts an offer on the same terms as the offerer. Vagueness or ambiguity in an offer or acceptance guarantees problems and may lead to litigation. The executive or consumer who articulates to herself precisely what she wants and then bargains clearly for it is likely to spend more time doing business and less time in court. Henry David Thoreau said that it takes two to speak the truth, one to speak and one to hear. Parties can form a contract only if they've had a meeting of the minds. This means that they must understand each other and intend to reach an agreement. A judge will then make an objective assessment of any disagreements about whether a contract was made, whether or not a reasonable person would conclude that there was an agreement based on the party's conduct. An offer is an act or statement that proposes definite terms and permits the other party to create a contract by accepting those terms. There are many problems with intent. For example, an invitation to bargain is not an offer. A price quote is generally not an offer. An advertisement is not an offer. A letter of intent may or may not be an offer, depending on the writer's intent. Also, placing an item up for auction is not an offer. It is merely a request for an offer. There are also problems with definiteness. For an offer to be guaranteed, the term of the offer must be definite. The UCC has provisions for supplying some missing contract terms. It establishes a price based on market value or valuation by a neutral party. An output contract obligates a seller to sell all of his output to one buyer who agrees to buy it. A requirements contract obligates a buyer to obtain all of his needed goods from the seller. Usually, delivery is at the seller's business. The time must be reasonable and payment is due upon receipt of goods. An implied warranty of merchantability means that the goods must be of at least average, passable quality in the trade. An implied warranty of fitness means the goods are suitable for a particular purpose. There is asymmetry in the rules for when an offeror's revocation of an offer is effective and when an offeree's acceptance of an offer is effective. The former is effective when the offeree receives it. The latter is effective when it is out of the offeree's control. These rules are not intuitive, require special emphasis, and provide excellent fodder for exam questions. Termination by revocation is effective when the offeree receives it. Common law rule means that the revocation of a firm offer is effective if the offeree receives it before he accepts. Option contract means that the offer may not revoke an offer during the option period. Sale of goods is a writing signed by a merchant offering to hold an offer open which may not be revoked. When an offeree rejects an offer, the rejection immediately terminates the offer. This is termination by rejection. When an offer specifies a time limit for acceptance, that period is binding. When the ending date has passed, termination by expiration will occur. If the offer specified no time limit, however, the offeree has a reasonable period in which to accept. Termination by operation of law refers to when death or mental incapacity of the, offer, off, of the offerer terminates an offer. Destruction of subject matter terminates the offer also. For acceptance to be valid, the offeree must say or do something to accept. In a bilateral contract, the offeree generally must accept by making a promise. In a unilateral contract, the offeree must accept by performing. If the, if the offer is ambiguous, the offeree may accept by either a promise or performance. The mirror image rule requires that acceptance be on precisely the same terms as the offer. Can a person form a binding agreement if he or she is intoxicated when making or accepting an offer? No. If one party is so intoxicated that he or she cannot understand the nature and consequences of the transaction, the contract is voidable. 
An offeree may include in the acceptance terms that are additional to or different from those in the offer. Additional terms are those that bring up new issues. If both parties are merchants, the additional terms will generally become part of the contract. Different terms are those that contradict terms in the offer. The majority of states hold that different or contradictory terms cancel each other out. If an offer demands acceptance in a particular medium or manner, the offeree must follow those requirements. If the offer does not specify a type of acceptance, the offeree may accept in any reasonable manner and medium. An acceptance is generally effective upon dispatch, meaning the moment it is out of the offeree's control. Under the doctrine of promissory estoppel, even if there is no contract, a promise may be enforceable if the offer makes a promise knowing the offeree is likely to reply or the offeree does, does in fact reply and the only way to avoid injustice is to enforce the promise. One thing that invitations to bargain and price quotes have in common is that if they were offers, then the offerer would almost invariably be unable to perform if everyone who received the invitation or price quote could form a contract by accepting its terms. Suppose a homeowner sends a letter to friends and neighbors expressing interest in selling his home with an asking price of $200,000 and a closing on a date three months later. If two recipients respond by saying, I accept, can the homeowner perform both agreements? Obviously not. He has only one house to sell. Is he therefore in breach of one of the agreements? If so, which one? If invitations to bargain and price quotes are understood in this fashion, then there should be no problem in recognizing why they are not offers. Letters of intent pose a different problem. A letter of intent is between two parties and does not raise the problem of multiple acceptances discussed earlier. The concern is that if negotiations break down, one party will treat the letter of intent as a binding agreement and seek its enforcement. Business people often want letters of intent near the start of negotiations because they serve valuable business purposes. Letters of intent can indicate areas of agreement and expose open terms, provide comfort that the distance between the parties' positions is small enough to warrant the time and expense of continued negotiation, interest investors to consider providing financing, and serve as the template for a definite contract if and when the parties reach agreement. Lawyers protect clients from the other side's undue reliance on the letter of intent as a binding agreement by peppering it with language disclaiming its creation of legal obligations and expressing its temporary nature, what is often called weasel language, because its purpose is to leave one's client with a way out of the deal.